Let's read the Word of God together. Stand as we read responsibly. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Amen. The word of God. You may be seated. Now that's a passage that we talked about last week. We're talking about again this week. And we're going to talk about it again next week. Now next week we're going to talk about making your home a place of God's blessing, making your home a place of God's blessing. But this morning, we're going to talk about another aspect of this passage. And to direct our thoughts to what we're going to talk about, I'd like to begin with some questions that relate to our experience. Are there times in your life, especially if you have been serious about following Christ, are there times in your life that no matter what you do, it doesn't seem to work out? Are there times in your life when you seem to pray and pray and the thing you pray about seems to get worse, not better? Are there times in your life when you wonder, God, have you forgotten about me? Oh, by the way, I'm here. I'm trying to honor you, and it seems that things are going the opposite direction. Anybody ever have those experiences? I'm reminded of the old television show that used to be on Hee Haw. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but there used to be a show called Hee Haw. And uh, it was quite popular. But I remember there was a segment on there, and they had a song. There was a fellow that sang a song. He says, gloom, despair, and ag ag gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. How many of us have ever sung that song and lived that experience? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. At the same time, especially when we're in those times in life, why is it that everybody else seems to have it so good? When we're in that place in life, it seems like everybody we're reminded of and everybody we look at is the opposite of us, right? Why do they have it so good? And then we just continue to spiral as we continue to feel sorry for ourselves more and more. And we get to the place where we lose perspective on reality many times. Well... What do we say? Well, we're just not lucky. You know, somebody, I used the word luck one time, and a fellow reminded me. He said, there's no, there's no such thing as luck. He said, if, if you want to think about luck, think of it this way, living under Christ's kindness. Living under Christ's kindness. But what do we, what do we think? What, what, what we think is, Lord, why are they blessed and not me? That, that's really, even though we may not have the courage to articulate it, but that's really what we're thinking. Why aren't I blessed like they are blessed? Why not me? Well, let's look at that issue 
as we consider who our God is, as we examine this passage in Genesis 12 a little more closely. First of all, in the passage that we just read, God's appearance to Abram and his promise to Abram in this watershed passage. To remind you again, this passage sets the stage for everything else that's going to happen in the Bible through the end of the book of Revelation. This passage is a foundational passage that's unfolded, and the promises that God makes to Abram here are unfolded throughout the rest of the Bible, and it's because of those promises that he made to Abram that we are here today. We are proof that the promises he made to Abram that day are real. We're proof of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as far as the evidence for that. But in this passage, in just the first three verses of that record, then God repeats the word bless five times. Five times a form of the word to bless is used. Now, whatever we think about blessing, again, let's be reminded that it's a good thing, right? It's a positive impact on our lives as opposed to curse, which is the opposite of bless. However we might define bless, we would all agree, would we not, that bless is positive, helpful. And God repeats the word bless five times. Now, why do you repeat yourself? Well, you usually repeat yourself to emphasize something. As we've been reminded before, some of us repeat something we said five minutes ago because we can't remember we, we said it. But usually we repeat ourselves because we want to emphasize. What is God trying to emphasize here? God is taking the initiative. This is a scenario Abraham didn't seek God just like us. We take no initiative toward God. That's what it means to be elected. That God takes the initiative in the relationship. God takes the first step. God took the initiative to seek out Abram and to tell him over and over again, I want to bless you. I want you to be a blessing. Through you, I want the whole world to be blessed. God is a God who is in the blessing business. And God commanded Abram to move. He asked him to obey him to trust him and prove it by his obedience, move to a place he'd never been before at 75 years to start over and trust that his wife could get pregnant and have children and didn't happen for 25 more years. Why? Because God wanted to bless not just him, but us as well. God is in the blessing business. You see, what the devil wants you to believe is the opposite is the opposite. If you go all the way back to Genesis 3 and you look at the initial temptation and the deception of Eve by the devil through the serpent, what you, what you discover is that the temptation was to question the goodness of God and the willingness of God to bless. In other words, the command of God was questioned as being for Eve and Adam's benefit. That's the heart of the temptation. And that's still true for you today. The thing that the enemy wants to do in your life is cause you to question whether or not following Christ is to your advantage. The devil wants you to think that the commands of God are simply to make your life miserable. When the opposite is true. God is in the blessing business. And God wants to bless. He takes the initiative with Abram to confirm that. Now, what is blessing? Well, one resource, one dictionary says it this way. To bless, this is a biblical definition. To bless means to endue with power for success, prosperity, fecundity, longevity, etc., in essence, the one who is blessed is given a rich and abundant life. That's one suggested definition of blessing. Another resource points out that 
blessing is a conveyance of an ability to have or to do something that otherwise you wouldn't have. Blessing is a transfer of power to somebody. It's an empowerment to do the will of God. And God wants to bless. God is in the blessing business and God wants to bless. God takes initiative to bless His people. That's at the heart of what we're talking about this morning that the Lord wants us to see is that God's motive in calling you to Himself is for His honor, His glory, and your benefit. And the heart of genuine faith is confidence in that. The Bible says, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. God wants to bless. God wants to be blessing to you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that, again, to reiterate, the context of that last promise is significant. Remember, the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. The Bible was written in words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, and books. The chapters and verses were simply added, and they in their final form weren't really complete in the way we have them for 1,500 years after Christ. It's a rel relatively recent innovation. For the first functionally 1,500 years of the church, the Bible wasn't chapters and verses. It was written as a whole, and it was read as a whole. And so, in that regard, it, that statement to be a blessing to all people needs to be read in light of what just came a few paragraphs earlier in the context of the book as Moses wrote. Because what you find is recorded in Genesis 11 was the judgment of God on all of humanity and the scattering of the people at what's known as the Tower of Babel. That was all people being judged by God. And out of that judgment, God turns around and calls Abram and says, I want to bless those people that I've judged. I don't want to leave it there. I want to bring them back to me. God wants to bless and God wants to bless you because you are proof of that promise because you are here today as a result of God's intentions that He expressed in that promise to bless all the peoples of the earth. You are the result of that. Now, to understand it even more clearly, look at the words of Jesus in John 10.10. 10. In John 10.10, 10, read that with me. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I would submit to you that this statement of Jesus in terms of its intent and its meaning is the functional equivalent of what God said to Abram, in you all the people of the earth will be blessed. You see, because blessing is whatever God gives that leads to life and vitality and wholeness as he intended. And Jesus says, I have come to give you a life that's abundant, a life that you naturally don't have. Now let's understand what Jesus is doing here. He's not preaching in a cemetery. He's not preaching to tombstones. He's not preaching to dead people. He's preaching to people who are conscious and alive. But God's perspective is that life is not simply conscious existence. Life is a quality of conscious existence that's beyond what we have apart from Him. Jesus used the phrase eternal life to describe it. God has a life for you that's what He wants to bless you with that's the very life of God Himself. And that's how you were made to live. Just as a gasoline automobile cannot run on diesel fuel, 
And that's the reason that the gas pump, if you try to put diesel in a gasoline car, it'll be difficult because they even make the pipe bigger so you can't get it down the, down the gas tank, right? See, I, I know that. See, what they've done is they've tried to make the gas pump idiot-proof. <laughs> because if you put that diesel fuel in there, it's going to wreck everything. car's not going to work right. Well, that's the same way you were built and designed by God, and there's only one kind of fuel you can run on, so to speak. It's the life of God himself given to you in Jesus Christ. Your body may be in conscious existence, but from God's perspective, you're really not alive until you have his life. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life. God says to Abram, I want to bless you. Synonymous statements, same God, same purpose. You see, what we need to understand is the fulfillment of that promise in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed, is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. God has blessed you in Jesus because he is a descendant of Abraham, a biological descendant of Abraham. As a result of Abraham's trust in God, God brought Jesus through his uh, descendants. And Jesus came to this earth and he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and he took the curse that we are under as he took the judgment for our sin upon himself that God might fulfill his intention of blessing us with his very life because God will not coexist with anything or anyone that is contrary to his purposes and his rule. And because of our sin, we're under his judgment, and Jesus was judged in our place, and he raised from the dead the third day to prove it. Now we're in a place to be blessed in Jesus to receive all that God intends for us. That's the God we serve. He not only took the initiative with Abraham, he ultimately took the initiative himself in Jesus and suffered greatly just so you could have life. That's the God who made us and to whom we're accountable. Dr. Gary Benedict was formerly president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. He made a statement one time that I really, really latched on to because it was such a, a powerful statement and such a, true, a truism. He said, God wants to bless, but we must put ourselves in a blessable place, in a blessable position. You say, you know, God wants to bless, but we have to be in a place to receive that blessing. Somebody wants you to give you a gift, you've got to take it, right? Well, there are certain ways that we receive the gift that God wants to give us. There's a place of blessing. And God articulates that through Moses in Deuteronomy to his people Israel. Listen to what God says in Deuteronomy. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. You see, the blessable position is to really believe God and to live life according to His Word. Is to make decisions even though it's inconvenient and even though it goes against what we would want to do, we want to believe that God has a better plan than we have for ourselves or anyone else if it conflicts with what he has told us to do. And herein is the heart of the matter. The reason we really don't trust Jesus and prove it by obeying him is because deep down inside, we don't believe his commands are intended for our blessing. We don't believe he, given a, he wants to give us a fulfilling life. How, how many of you have ever heard it said, and maybe even said yourself, I've heard people say off and on throughout my life, well, yeah, you know, I understand about Jesus and following Jesus and church and all that stuff, but you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I want to have fun, live my life, and I'm going to do that when I'm older. Can't have any more fun. Anybody ever heard that? Huh? 
Surely you have. I'm not living in a vacuum, am I? And how many of us actually have even thought that? You see, that's at the heart of the matter. That's exactly what Satan tempted Eve with back in the Garden of Eden, is God's desires for your life are joy stealers, are robbers of a life that you could really have apart from Him. That is the heart of the lie that is imposed upon humanity from hell. You see... We've got to get to the point where we recognize in the Word of God that God's way is best. And I would submit to you that one reason that people outside of Christ have that opinion is because of us who claim to follow Him and the kind of life we lead in their presence. That's the reason we need to brag on Jesus everywhere we go because people need to know who Jesus really is. And if we're not living a life that they know they can't have on their own, if there's not something different about us, then it's logical that they would reach that conclusion. It's logical that they would reach that conclusion. I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I want to communicate that. I, and, and, and it happens in day, everyday life. I, I've shared before, I remember the incident one time I was on a golf course years ago. And a guy playing with me had a flask inside his golf bag. And he pulled it out and took a little shot of it and he offered it to me. And I said, thank you, pal, but I don't need it. I got something better. I got something better. I don't need an artificial high. I've got the real thing. I've got the God who called the universe into existence out of nothing inhabiting my body. Right now. Anything less than that is second class. I have an opportunity to have an audience every day with the king of the universe who opens himself and makes himself available to me because the blood of his son has purified me and made me worthy, not worthy in the sense of my own works, but able to stand before him freely with no hindrance and have a conversation with the God of gods. I haven't run across a deal yet that can match that or even think about exceeding it. I'm especially burdened when it comes to a younger generation in this regard. Uh, you know, uh, and it's not new to this time and era, but historically, especially younger people have had the impression that, you know, following Christ is a joy robber. Well, listen, behavior and decisions when a person is young are like compounded interest. You put a little bit in the bank at interest and invest it at a very young age and you leave it there for 30, 40 years and guess what? It's a lot more than when it started out. And I will tell you that decisions made when we're young for Christ or against Him may not appear significant at the time, but 30, 40 years go by and they will grow in significance beyond what we're able to understand. And one of the huge challenges of parents is to live our lives in such a way that our children see that Christ is more desirable than anything the world of the devil can give them because of what they see about him in us and the benefit to their life. You see, it all goes back to the words in Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, read this with me. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You see, that key phrase is the last one, the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. The question is, does God really want to bless us or not? And here's the hard part. When we try to follow Christ and things don't go according to plan, we begin to doubt if God's in our corner and we're tempted not to trust Him. You know, it's interesting. As years have gone by for me, I remember back when I was 15, 20 years old, 25 years old, 
I had, even though I didn't write it out, I had in my mind this script for my life. I had a predetermined script for my life. Anybody else ever, anybody know about that? Anybody ever have this idea? Here's where, hey, this is what, I, you know, I've got it all planned out, right? I want, well, somehow God forgot to read my script. <laughs> because nowhere, I mean, that, they're not, they're not going according to, it hadn't gone that way. It hadn't happened that way. But you know what? I trust that if it had been according to my terms, it wouldn't have been near as fulfilling or adventurous or as fruitful because I believe that the best is yet to come for those who follow Christ. And in following Christ, if the Lord tarries, let me give you another clue that's based on Abram's life and others in the Bible. You know when the most fruit's going to come from your life after you're gone. You see, do we believe that he's a rewarder? Anybody can believe God is. That's no big deal. Bible says that straight out. That's demon faith. James chapter 2, so you believe in God. The demons believe and tremble in fear. Everybody, well, everybody believes, like somehow that's a pass. That, that's, that's no accomplishment to believe God exists. The key is, do we believe that God has our best interest in mind and trusting Him and living His way is the only way to truly live in spite of the inconvenience or what it might cost us. Those people in my friend's church over in Africa, it cost them dearly to follow Christ, but they believed that there was something God had for them waiting that was far better than anything they could ever pay here. If you think that following Jesus is drudgery just so we can get to heaven and you don't understand what it means to follow Jesus and have eternal life, you do not get it. You are misinformed. I would encourage you to read your Bible. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now let me close with a thought. We're talking about being blessed. <clears throat> You know, it's interesting that one of the most famous passages about blessing in the Bible is found in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it's called, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it begins with what are commonly known as the Beatitudes or the blessings. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are those who uh, uh, mourn, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness' sake, etc. Right? You familiar with those? Those blessings. Well, there's an interesting insight into that if you look closely at the words that are used. The common word, the primary word for blessing in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, the primary word for that is a word you're familiar with. It's the word eulogeo. It's eulogy. Anybody ever heard the word eulogy? When's that used? That's used in the context of like a, a funeral and someone says something positive about the deceased that's known as a eulogy because the word eulogy literally means good word it means good word it means to say something positive and the word eulogy is the word the primary word translated blessing that's not the word used in the sermon on the mount in fact it's interesting if you go back and look at some various Bible translations, the old Young's Literal Translation. I usually consult it when I really want to know in English what the understanding is of the Greek behind it. This guy was like in 1862. Many of you have heard of Young's Bible Concordance. Some of you may have run across that. Same guy. And he wrote a literal, back in 1862, a literal translation. And here's how he translates the, the Beatitudes. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the pure in heart. You know why he translates it that way? Because that's exactly what it says. It's not the word eulogy that's used there. It's the word makarios. And makarios is a word that is most accurately translated in the Greek language by the word happy. We say, well, why do they use blessed? Because it's more than a superficial giddiness that's being talked about. 
It's a deep sense of fulfillment. Listen to what Richard's Expository Dictionary of Bible Words, listen to what he says about Makarios. Makarios of the New Testament is a divine paradox, an experience of the kingdom's inner riches amid external poverty and trial. We have, listen to this, we have in Jesus himself the abundant life for which we yearn and which God has ever yearned to give straying mankind. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abram because what the Beatitudes are saying is this, is that in Jesus we have everything that money is trying to buy and cannot. In Jesus... The end game of blessing is upon us. That in Jesus, beyond the circumstances of life, we have a fulfillment that is supernatural and beyond our ability to explain or understand logically. And that's the promise that God was giving Abram that was fulfilled in him. Point is, there is no way for you to have a fulfilling life apart from Jesus Christ as God intended. But with that, you can have a life and with Him that you never dreamed possible. So I'll end with the title of the message today from that great theologian, uh, Phil Robertson. Happy, happy, happy. That's what it means to truly walk with Jesus. Even though the circumstances... Are the opposite. He brings an inner fulfillment that you cannot get anywhere else. That's the reason going to this table for those who follow him should make us happy, happy, happy.